Hey there, this is Dr. Evan Osar, founder of Fitness Education Seminars, the movement-based solution to the healthcare crisis, and author of the Corrective Exercise Solutions to Common Hip and Shoulder Dysfunction. Thank you so much for tuning into this webinar. If you attended this session at ECA Thrive 2012, welcome. Thank you for coming to the session, and here is your free webinar. If you train boot camp or group exercise, then this webinar is for you. You give so much energy to your clients. You have to give your all every single day to 10, 20, 30, maybe even 50 or more individuals. So what I want to do in this webinar is teach you guys how to take care of yourselves so you can continue to serve those clients that need and want what you have to give them. And hopefully some of this will translate over into your group exercise or boot camp classes so that you can help your clients remain injury free. So let's get started. As boot camp and group exercise instructors, you are the past and the present. You guys have the hardest job in the fitness industry because you have to give your energy to so many individuals. You have to keep the class moving. You have to keep them safe. You have to keep them energized and you have to give them results. So you have a really challenging job. And back in the days of leotards and, and short shorts and tank tops and spandex to the current day situation and conditions that we see in the fitness industry, you guys are the future as well. So again, thank you for all your contributions to the industry. A lot of us newer trainers and newer people in the fitness industry have a lot to owe to you guys that have been around and set the stage for personal training all the way back in the 60s, and 70s, and the 80s. So that set, up, set us up for today. So thank you, but don't, re don't forget you guys are still the future, more and more individuals exercising and with the economy the way it is more and more people will choose to look for group exercise for motivation cost-effective way to get instruction and for the community that you guys provide for your clients so keep up the great work another cool thing that's happening in the industry is even when we start looking at the trends of the future group training is right there at the future so in 2013, we can still look for group training to be the way that most individuals will probably get exercise. Yes, there will always be the need for one-on-one. -on -one. There will always be the need for specialized services, but group training, boot camps, some private group training will, is the future and will continue to be strong going here in the next few years. Another trend for the 2013 is education. We have to keep ourselves educated. We have to keep learning more about how the body functions, learning more how to motivate people, learning how to tap into people's psychology so we can continue to be that solution that our clients need and want. And with the internet, with books and courses, there's never an easier time to get educated. So again, keep learning, don't stop. Another great trend for 2013 is special populations. If you train clients, you know that there's special there's certain populations that need a special attention. We know we have a, we have a problem with our youth. Too many kids are overweight. Too many kids are sedentary. Too many kids are suffering from those chronic injuries that we only that we used to only see in the adult population. So our kids need help. Our senior baby boomer populations are are growing at astronomic rates. We have a great opportunity to work with that population and keep them active and healthy in their advancing years. They know that they need to be active. They know that they need to be fit. They know that they need help doing this. We are in a great position. So keep up doing what you're doing and don't forget about the special populations where you can really carve out a really specialized niche for yourself in the coming years. So the question for the day is why are there so many hip, knee, and ankle injuries and why are there so many of them that aren't reported? Of course they come to us as chiropractors and physical therapists and manual therapists. But how come so many of them aren't actually attributing their injuries to what's happening in their group exercise class? And why are so many of you guys, as group exercise instructors, getting injured during your classes? Well, one of the re biggest reasons is our exercise themselves because injuries are happening in our group class whether we want to admit it or not. And you see this gentleman here, you see he does not get enough anterior pelvic tilt, so therefore he's over flexing through his spine. This guy here, he's got the no butt or the flat butt syndrome. 
no glutes there. And again, going into a posterior tilt, this lady here, not enough shoulder flexion, so she's going into external rotation and jamming her humeral head into the, the glenoid. And again, we, we see so many of these deconditioned individuals now jumping around, doing things like push-ups. And you see these people here, they're, they're, she's about to bonk her head on, on the ground, no scapular stability. This guy's got no core stability. This person thinks that, that you know, the TP is a way to, uh, creating a, a tent is, is a way to do a proper push-up, and who knows what this girl over here is doing. So we know these, these things are happening in our group exercise class. So what can we do to make them, make our classes safer and more effective? and equally as effective, and maybe even more effective. Because again, we know that these inju injuries are happening. Part of the reasons, reason is we have a perpetuation of things like group exercise and styles that create and say that fitness is a sport. We have to remember that fitness is not a sport. Fitness is a way to make our sports better. Fitness is a way to enhance a specific function and an end goal, but fitness itself is not a sport. And when we start to create a sport out of fitness, people are going to get injured and injured pretty badly. So our biggest problem is that our habitual patterns are what's causing our problems. Again, we're heading into the holidays and we're, there's going to be a lot of bending over, a lot of baking, a lot of excessive eating. I too will partake in that. And again, when we lift our children, when we lift groceries, when we perform our daily activities, we have these patterns set up in our bodies that are, that are creating our problems. And again, these are the same things that we take into our group exercise class. And if you look at these individuals here, you see a lot of pelvic unleveling. This, this woman in the image to the right, you see that she's not only pelvic unlevel, but she also has internal rotation at the hip and the knee, which is going to affect both areas as well as her ankle. And you see that how much erector tone she has in a split squat position. Again, me here, trying to do a step up on a, on a step that's too large or too high for my available range of hip flexion will create lumbar stress. And again, put some more stress on my knee. So how do we make these things, these exercises, and these patterns more effective for our clients? And what about high group exercise and boot camp classes? Remember these systems like HIT, high intensity interval training, CrossFit and Tabatas, a lot of these systems were set up for athletes like Dara Torres. And we talked about how Dara Torres spends over $100,000 a year taking care of her body, making sure that she's fit, working with a trainer, chiropractors, massage therapists, in addition to a coach to get her body to perform at a super high level. My patient here, how much money do you think he spends on his body taking care of itself, probably whatever his copay is. He comes in when he's in pain. So, and this is so common of many of our clients. So we have to be careful when we start using these high intensity styles to train our general population client because those are the clients that are coming to our classes. It doesn't mean you, you don't train them hard. It just means that we have to be aware that some of these systems can break our people down when they're not ready to be worked at that level. Okay. So here's three common causes. One thing we, I hear a lot is that nobody gets injured on my shift. And again, you have a hard job ahead of you when you have 30 to 50 people in your group or even 15 people trying to watch everybody. You cannot go over and fix everybody's form. You cannot cue everybody the exact right way. So throughout the course of this webinar, I want to teach you some common things that happen to our clients, how some of our our cueing can actually create problems, and then some better cues that can target the majority of the things we see in our clients. And of course, help yourself along the process. Okay. Another common cause for injury is keeping up with the Joneses. And you see this woman here giving the evil eye to this guy over here. And it, what you see here is not one of these individuals has a good shoulder alignment. And that's, again, we try to keep exercises fresh. We try to make people work hard to get at certain results. But we have to realize that these exercises, especially when they're done to fatigue, create and set up, set up and create poor movement and stabilization patterns. It's hard to stabilize properly when we are fatigued or when we are asked to do positions and our movements our bodies are not ready for. So again, another reason why we're getting injuries. 
But what about this? It's only three pounds. I hear this all the time from my patients. But I only lift three pounds and I don't understand why, why my neck hurts. Well, three pounds after you're doing a set for 30, 40, 60 repetitions or for a minute doesn't feel like 30 pounds to your stabilizers of your neck, of your spine, of your lower extremity. So again, that three pounds or that little bit of movement you're doing, all of a sudden now, as you start to break down from fatigue and just overwork, starts to become more incremental or exponential, I should say, as to the effects it's having on our stabilization system. So again, even though clients are using three pounds, just remember that they get fatigued pretty quickly, okay? And make sure that you're paying attention to that as, our, as your clients are doing more and more repetitions or they get further into the workout, okay? So what's the problem? The biggest problem, problem we see in a lot of our group exercise class, especially as it comes as it relates to hip, knee, and ankle injuries, is the disruption of the stabilization dissociation model. And basically what this model says, there's some regions of the spine that are better, or spine and, and kinetic chain, that are better suited for stabilization, while others are better suited for dissociation or the ability to move. Now, all joints, synovial joints, need to stabilize at certain points and be the fixed point and at other times be the movement point. So it's not to suggest that one is, you know, certain areas of the body never move and others always move. It just means that at certain times, at certain opportunities, and there's certain consistent breakdowns of this model that creates problems. So let's look at some common hip, knee, and ankle problems and how this model relates to those injuries. The stabilization dissociation model we look at the lumbosacral region and we know that that area must be stable. The hip, ball and socket must be mobile. The knee, as we're loading it, must be stable. The ankle must be able to dissociate, so we, so we must be able to get mobility through or move under neuromuscular control through the ankle. And the foot must be a mobile adapter, but then become a stable platform to load up the entire body. So. What happens at the hip? The hip, which should be mobile, becomes stiff. Stiff because of butt gripping. Stiff because of cueing to squeeze the glutes. Stiff because we sit too long. Stiff because it's trying to stabilize, overstabilize for a weak pelvic floor. So there's many reasons that contribute to hip stiffness. The common compensations is we increase motion through the lumbosacral junction, the sacroiliac joint, and of course the knee. And again, the most common reasons people see me as a chiropractic physician, low back pain, SI joint pain, and knee pain. Okay, what about the knee? The knee which should be stable. Well, the problem becomes when we decrease mobility or range of motion at our hips and or our ankles. Therefore, it leads to increased knee abduction and even internal rotation, leading to a lot of the problems we see with our clients that have knee problems. What about the ankle? The ankle should be relatively mobile. We should be able to dissociate our tibia over top of our foot or the foot underneath the tibia. The foot, again, needs to be a mobile adapter to the ground, but then become a stable platform to push off of. The problem, the ankle becomes stiff from chronic ankle sprains, from poor footwear, from tight gastric soleus, from poor exercise choice and then the foot increases mobility. We can also increase mobility at the knee. Again, the foot, increased foot mobility creates bunions, neuritis, neuromas, metatarsalgia problems at the foot. So again, what we want to do is create and change and alter and improve this relationship between the ankle, knee, hip, and low back. Okay, so our solution is restore proximal st stabilization. We have to make sure the core is set up properly so we can set up the lower extremity properly as well. We have to align the, the lower extremity in the right manner. I'll show you exactly how to do that. And then we have to activate the foot extensor reflex so we don't have to over rely on our extensor system, our erectors, or butt squeezing, butt, butt clenching, butt gripping to create stability. So I'll show you how to do that as well. Okay, so. Number one, restore proximal stabilization. The thoracopelvic canister, otherwise known as a rib cage, spine, and pelvis, should be a canister. Our respiratory system is set up inside there. Our core muscles are set up inside the thoracopelvic canister, and they provide stability to our trunk. 
which allows us to express motion through our limbs. When the thracopelvic canister is broken down or compensated through, then we have to overutilize or create compensations through our extremities. The way we improve function is we is through our functional ABCs. A, alignment, B, breathing, C, coordination. The coordination of breathing and core activation. That allows us to generate intra-abdominal pressure, which then creates stability, and again, allows us the ability to decompress the spine and create length through the spine. When we can de decompress the spine and increase length, we can free up the hips, we can align the lower extremity and put our body in an optimal position. So we wanna align the thoracic inlet, which is the top horizontal line, the diaphragm, and the pelvic floor. These three areas should be lined up. Our rib cage should be positioned directly over top of the pelvis, and the ribs should feed down into the pelvis. So we have a nice canister here, good alignment. Again, that allows us to free up the hips for mobility, allows us to free up the shoulder for mobility. We want to create a long spine. So we want to give clients a cue to stay long through the spine, keep the rib cage and pelvis aligned, keep the rib cage soft. Do not overutilize the erectors to lift the rib cage. Think long like you're hanging from a string tied to the top of your head and think long like your tailbone is getting heavy and moving towards the floor. We wanna make sure we have a pelvic pyramid so that our pelvis is positioned and balanced over our lower extremities. This allows us to support the spine and accepts ground reaction forces through the hips and into the spine. So our pelvis, a neutral alignment is when the ASIS and the pubic symphysis is in a vertical alignment. When we are in an anterior tilt, the ASIS comes further forward than the pubic symphysis, and we're in a posterior tilt when the pubic symphysis comes further forward than the ASIS. The anterior tilt is a more optimal position for heavier loading. So if your clients are lifting heavier, or you're lifting heavier, an anterior pelvic tilt is preferred. When you're trying to get long, a posterior tilt, especially during rotation, for example, is more optimal. We want to be neutral during most of our activities, especially when, when we're loading up just in a general exercise class. Most of our clients are not in an anterior pelvic tilt, as we learned, because we sit. When we sit, the pelvis rotates back, the lumbar spine flexes. We get real stiff through a posterior hip capsule that pulls us into a posterior tilt. So again, we want to actually encourage our clients not to grip their butt and actually think about being longer through the spine and not gripping and not tucking under. The pronation, pronation syndrome is when we have poor control of pronation. And that's a lot of times why we have clients squeeze their glutes, rotate their hips out. We need to teach these clients how to better control their medial arch and connect that medial stabilization chain up into their glutes. The lower extremity distortion syndrome is one of the most common things you're gonna see in your clients. And that's when you, if you look at your client, their knee is facing forward towards you, but their lower extremity is turned out. And this is also often a compensation for poor stabilization at the hip, poor core stabilization, and poor ability to align the lower extremity. So we start rotating the foot out to increase stability, and we start creating more shearing and rotation forces through the knee. And that's, again, leads to a lot of problems through the meniscus, the ACL, and patellar degeneration. Lower extremity distortion syndrome is when we have the unsquared pelvis, we have loss of hip internal rotation, abduction of the knee, external rotation of the tibia, and a medial collapse of the foot. And again, this is what it looks like when a client's running. And this is what's happening when they walk and especially when they run and they're loading up that lower extremity even more. And this is one of the biggest things that will lead to IT band problems, patellar tendon problems, IT band friction syndromes, lower extremity problems, as well as hip and low back problems. We have to teach our client how to line up their lower extremity to help prevent this issue. We have some clients that have a supination syndrome, and that's when you lose internal rotation of the lower extremity. So we need to teach these clients, again, how to connect that medial stabilization chain to bring that foot back down into the ground to stabilize that foot tripod and line that hip, knee, ankle, and foot. So I'll show you how to do that. So 
Part two, now we align the lower extremity. So in the front leg mechanics, we want to teach a client how to be square through the pelvis. Create that pelvic pyramid, pelvic pyramid, and then square that pelvis. Align up the hip and the knee. Line up the knee with the ankle and foot. Create that foot tripod. On the lower or on the back extremity, same thing. Line up the hip, knee, ankle, foot, and you have a sort of a pseudo tripod through the big big toe, small toe, and to the tip of the big toe. Then we're going to activate the foot. You see this image of the modified kneeling reach. We're teaching the client how to stabilize through their hand, which feeds up into scapular stabilization. We teach the client how to stabilize the foot, which leads up into the hip. So again, we, we can use the foot and the hand to help set up the shoulder and the hips reflectively, respectively. This, is, this occurs through the law of irradiation, and that's when foot and knee alignment where with activation of the foot and then the proper alignment of the foot irradiates up the kinetic chain. So by placing the foot in the right position where the metatarsals are long, the phalanges are long and spread out, it stretches the interosseous muscles in between the toes and it creates and turns on the extensor reflex. So that foot position is so key to getting the entire kinetic chain to create extension. Oftentimes in the fitness industry, we overutilize the glutes and the hamstrings and the lumbar erectors to squeeze and lift ourselves and train that posterior chain. But if what we miss oftentimes is that foot tripod. That's what really sets up the entire posterior chain and, and gets us extension without having to overutilize the extensors. So again, the foot tripod is gonna be a big key to setting up the entire lower extremity. When we talk about the foot tripod, it does not mean that we're solely supported on these three big black dots, the foot tripod. It just means that we want the majority of our weight here, but we also want weight across all metatarsals, and we also want the tips of the toes in contact with the ground. We want the majority or bulk of the stress to be underneath the first metatarsal phalangeal, second, and third metatarsal phalangeal joints. We also want to create the medial arch and respect the medial arch because that will set up the lower extremity alignment. So again, we think about bringing the big toe down towards the ground, the metatarsal phalangeal arch down towards the ground and creating that medial arch, maintaining that medial arch, and then think of that connection all the way up to the lower, deeper medial fibers of the glutes. Okay. Now, so we'll move into our cues for the TPC. Oftentimes we teach our clients to lift our chest up and again that creates the thoracolumbar hyperextension. A better cue is to soften your chest and elongate the neck. So we want to create, we want to bring that rib cage down in the front, bring the thorax long in the back, and think long through the head and neck. That aligns that the spine, and aligns that thoracal pelvic canister, and helps us align that lower extremity in a more optimal position. We do not want to teach our clients, even though we tell them oftentimes, pull your abs in, squeeze your glutes, because what these, these cues do is, is when you pull in your abs, it puts you in a posterior tilt. When you squeeze your glutes, it rotates your pelvis into a posterior tilt. Again, getting that pubic symphysis out in front of the ASIS, and we get gluteal clenching or and or also known as butt gripping. Let those abs go, let the hips go. Think of a long spine here, think of the tailbone dropping down, so we keep that pelvis level. Do not teach clients to squeeze their glutes. Most clients have no problem squeezing their glutes. They do have problems with letting the glutes go. So teach them how to relax and activate. Again, this is what it looks like when they over clench their glutes. You have a deep hollowing on the outside of the hips and it drives the femoral head forward. This creates one of the most common causes for hip degeneration, hip pinching, and low back problems. Teach your clients to relax and center the hips and widen through their sits bones. Once we've done that, now teach them how to align, breathe, and connect. So again, in this picture, I'm, teaching, I'm helping my client think of that medial knee connection through the foot, knee, and into the hip. Teaching her how to relax and sit back through the hips. A lot of our clients are hip grippers, not only posteriorly, but also through the rectus femoris and TFL. They grip the hip, which drives it forward, which 
limits how far they can move back into their hip. Teach a client how to relax and sit back into their hips. Okay? Hip hinge is a great pattern to dissociate the trunk and pelvis from the lower extremity. So we teach a client how to set up the hip, knee, ankle, and foot, and now dissociate or hinge through the hip. We want to teach them how to create the anterior pelvic tilt. Most of our clients have short, stiff hamstrings and cannot get into anterior pelvic tilt. This is a great exercise to create functional lengthening through the hamstrings and teach them how to spare the spine and maintain a neutral thoracal pelvic canister. During the squat, we also want to line up the thoracal pelvic canister and line up the hip, knee, ankle, and foot and set up the foot tripod. How far do you have your client squat or go down into a split squat? You can have them go as far as they can while maintaining hip, knee, and ankle alignment, the foot tripod, and alignment of the thoracal pelvic canister. You can, you can have them put a hand on, on their thorax, a hand on their abdomen, and make sure that the hands stay equal distance apart during their squat or split squat. Same thing with a lunge. We want to line up the TPC, line up the hip, knee, ankle, and foot. And when we're doing a stepping lunge, a stationary, or which would be a split squat, so to speak, or, or just a, a mobility lateral lunge, we want to make sure that the foot tripod stays. We want to make sure that we keep the alignment whether we're doing forward, lateral, or transverse plane lunges. Bridge, same thing. We want to set up the foot tripod. We want to lift up into proper alignment. And you see the image to the left. I'm overextending through the thoracolumbar lumbar junction. I'm driving the pelvis, the femoral head forward because I'm over squeezing my glutes. I create a big divot here. Here, I have much better gluteal activation. I can centrate my hip in the socket. I have good alignment between my hip and knee, and all the way through my thoracal pelvic canister. I maintain this alignment throughout the pattern, maintain good core activation versus dissociating and letting go of the abdominal wall in the way most of our clients are doing their bridges. What about cardio if you're teaching spin class? Again, same thing. Again, this is really isn't that bad of a posture, but again, it still creates, you see that those lines in his neck, it's still creating shearing and increased lordosis of the cervical spine, especially in clients that have poor scapular stability and poor neck alignment. Teach your client how to connect the thoracal pelvic canister and stay long through the spine. And you can see the improved alignment when the client thinks about being long and versus when he's just kind of hanging out in his normal posture. Okay, so this is a very effective strategy for your clients in cardio classes. And of course, if you're, if you're doing any running in your class, teach them how to align their lower extremity so that they can better perform running, jumping, sprinting type drills without creating shearing through their knee, flattening and loading, poor loading through their foot, and pelvic unleveling. Again, we should have a relatively level pelvis and an alignment through the hip, knee, ankle and foot. So here's your three take-home keys. Keep doing what you're doing that works. Again, you guys have the most challenging job in the fitness industry. You guys are already doing an awesome job. Keep it up. Align the TPC. Set up the foot tripod and align the lower extremity. Make sure you keep cueing them appropriately throughout the class so they maintain that alignment. Check in with them. Make Have them check in with it themselves to make sure they're aligned and self-monitoring what they're doing with their own bodies and always empower. You guys do a great job doing this all the time. Make sure you guys are getting empowered. And I hope some of this has helped you keep yourself safe so you can keep empowering your clients. If you're looking for further resources, check out our website, fitnesseducationseminars.com. You can sign up for our free e-resource, Fitness Insider. There's tons of free video clips. You don't even, you don't even have to sign up for our our newsletter to get the free clips, but we send up new videos every couple weeks and they're and you have full access to them through our website. We provide up-to-date corrective exercise strategies for training the general population who most of you work with. And will these strategies work with athletes? Absolutely, but we gear what we do for the general population. So I wanna thank you so much for watching this webinar and hope it has helped you remain informed so you can become the specialist and expert that your clients need and want. This is Dr. Evan Osar of Fitness Education Seminars, providing you with solutions and strategies you need to be the movement-based solution to the healthcare crisis. We'll catch you next time.